And hello everybody, it's a beautiful Friday evening in Northeast Pennsylvania. Want to give a shout out to those uh, friends and family of mine back on the West Coast. Last week, uh, I was blessed to have my uh, very close friend Mike get on and watch uh, one of our services. And uh, I know some of my family members in Oregon and Washington, they do watch once in a while, so we praise the Lord for that. Uh, it's 7 p.m. here, and we had a beautiful warm day. I mean, you wouldn't even know it was um, winter. I mean, it was more like a spring a spring day. Chicky, it's good to see you from Arizona. I think it's Arizona, right, Chicky? Okay. Well, it's great to see everybody and, and to have you, you log on and watch us faithfully. If you have a chance, make sure you hit your, your share button so anybody who's looking to hear a little bit of the word and some encouragement that they'll have a chance to listen in. And uh, don't forget that we have our uh, Facebook Live services on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday nights at 7. My wife, she teaches a powerful message every Wednesday at 7 p.m. And on Sundays, we have our 1045 Facebook Live um, in the morning. And uh, we're looking forward to that. Pastor Tim and I, we rotate our teaching and preaching on Fridays and on Sundays. So if you want to give to the ministry, we do appreciate anything that God lays on your heart. You can go to Elisha'sHome.com and you can uh, hit the uh, donate button and pay through that. Or you can send a check to 11 Climas, capital K-L-I-M-A-S Road, Montrose, PA, 18801. And if you're looking for that address, you can also um, go on to Elisha'sHome.com and it will give you our address. Uh, it's so good to see you. Uh, Jeff just logged on. Good to see you, Jeff. Uh, Jeff was blessed to be one of those grandparents that helped helped uh, uh, his grandson shoot his first deer. That's pretty exciting. I know how that is. Uh, not grandson, but my son. So it, it can be really neat to be uh, teaching your kids how to hunt. So anyway, in a couple minutes, I'll be getting back uh, to uh, part two of It Starts Right Here. You know, I'm just curious how many of you have used this time where we've been semi-locked down or locked down or quarantined. Have you used it to get rid of your honey-do lists? Uh, I've been blessed. Peg and I have been keeping busy trying to, you know, we had extra paint laying around, so we painted some rooms that we hadn't painted in years, uh, cleaned out and sorted. I think Peg calls it decluttered. You know, that's something to think about. If you haven't used it in, oh... A year, two years, six years, ten years. Some of the stuff we found, it was behind an old uh, cabinet over 20 years ago. It was there. So, you know what? I think it's time to clean house, right? Or clean up and declutter. And uh, I tell you what, we've actually had a good time doing it. And uh, would you believe it? Now, I don't do windows and doors. and You just know that. But I actually got on my hands and knees and scrubbed a couple areas on the floor. Yeah, it took some time to get back up off my hands and knees, but I I did it. So you know what, man, get in there, help your wife, get get the honey do list taken care of, and before we know it, we'll be back to normal. So anyway, let's get started with tonight's service. It's now seven o three, and uh, I just just want to share some things that have been on my heart a lot lately, and and I shared last Tuesday about that song. Uh, it starts right here by Casting Crowns. And it really, really does. And I love hearing that song. And, and it's funny. I know my, my church people, they hear me preach on these different songs. So when I hear these songs after I preached it, they have a lot deeper meaning. Meaning, I should say. So uh, it's something to, something to think about. Anyway, um, last Tuesday, I stated it starts right here. Ultimately, it starts right with you and me, personally. One-on-one, -on -one, you know, between us and God. And that's that's the important thing. And when you look in the mirror, do you see the man or woman that God sees? Or do you see your imperfections? You know, oh, let's see, I have this mark here. And oh, when I was a teenager, I had acne. And Do you focus on the physical? Or are you looking at yourself like God sees you? It's something to really think about. I brought up that you need to... Um, hmm, how can I say this? We all should have, or hopefully will have, a desire to be a world changer. I've talked about this in other sermons. And, you know, often people say, well, I'm not a world changer. But 
You know, it's the old butterfly effect. I think somebody once said that if a butterfly flaps its wings in South America or in Africa, would the current wind currents feel it in America? I don't know. But I do believe for every action, there's a reaction. And we can change the world, even if it's one person, one moment at, at a time. It starts with us looking in the mirror and realizing that we're a child of the king. And uh, we, we need to say, Lord, you know, I want to be a world changer. And if it's in my house first, fine. If it's, if it's in my workplace, fine. If it's in my neighborhood. You know, I, I remember, I'm trying to think. Uh, I know that one of the members of our church uh, during the COVID lockdown dressed himself in one of those um, giant dinosaur uh, costumes and gave out uh, candy and food and stuff. And, you know, sometimes we just need to do something to, to encourage people. And often we don't do that. We're so wrapped up in our own little world. And the main scripture that I used last week was uh, 2 Chronicles 7.14 in the Amplified. And you've all, you know this, but do you really understand it? Is it really, is it really in here? And it says, Then my people who are called by my name humble themselves and they pray and they seek and they crave and require as a necessity my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from them from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. You know, and again, that was when, you know, the people of Israel were dealing with some heavy duty stuff. And God warned them, if you do this, this, and this, but if you cry out to me, this will happen. And he said, if you humble yourselves, you pray and you seek and you crave and require as necessity. That your prayer is a necessity and you desire God as a necessity. And you seek his face and you turn away from the old ways. You're no longer the old person, no longer the old stuff. God will begin to use you and change things around you and make you into a world changer. In that song, Casting Crowns, that I was talking about, um, part I'm just going to repeat a few pieces of it. Uh, in the chorus on the song, it said, But we want to see the heart set free and the tyrants kneel. The walls fall down and our land be healed. But church, if we want to see a change in the world out there, it's got to start right here. And, you know, he talked about, do you feel like the prodigal son? And I thought, man, how many of us? Have, and people said, what do you mean? You know, because you're still going to church, you're still in the church. But the prodigal son, he was still with the father, but was he really with the father? His soul was, I think the way the song puts it, his soul was dead. Because he, he didn't love the father because he was the father. He just said, well, you know, I'm the son. I'm hanging around. You know, when do I get my um, inheritance? He wasn't concerned about the love of the father as much as, uh, well, my brother got this and I didn't. And why are you, you know, he, jealousy and pride seemed to kick in. So really his soul was dead. So, and it went on to say, but church, if we want to see a change in the world out there, it's got to start right here. At the end of the song, it says, If we all surrender our pride and turn from our ways, he will hear from heaven, and he will forgive our sins, and he will heal, heal our land. And again, that's back to Second Chronicles 7.14. So remember, the Lord said, I'm st I'm st or in the song, it says, I'm starting right here, and I'm starting right now. So you, you have to take ownership. That's, that's what I'm trying to get across. I shared what the basic world changer should be. A world changer is someone who is committed to do just that, change the world. A world changer is not someone who blends in. A world changer sticks out, uh, stands up, and is ready to make a difference. A world changer goes beyond the usual expectations of Christianity. Now you think about that. A world changer finds the most intense demands that Jesus places on Christians and doesn't shy away from them, but he goes after them with all his heart. A world changer does whatever it takes to get the job done. A world changer pursues God passionately. He or she is not just doing it because their parents make them do it or because the pastor bribes them. A world changer has been radically, completely, and totally changed. I remember, uh, what was it, um, Toby Mack or Carmen had a song, no it was Carmen, it was uh, called Radically Saved. You know, and what you're doing for Christ, is it radical? Radical like Christ would have done. So often, you know, we, you, you ask yourself, am I really doing things for Christ or am I just skating along doing whatever I want to do? 
See, the importance of every Christian needs to know that we all need to know that God wants to multiply his life a thousandfold through us. Do you get that? We need to know that. We need to make sure that Christians know that God wants to, to multiply who he is, have people get to know who he is through each individual. And so we need to represent Christ in that way. God has also built us, and I love this, he has built, he has built, he has built spiritual DNA into us once we're born again to desire to reproduce ourselves. But human beings as as a whole has a desire in the physical realm to, to reproduce. But I mean in the spiritual sense, he has a desire for us to reproduce ourselves. Life is more than just, and, and I, it's so frustrating to me sometimes because people don't believe when I tell them that life is more than just living and dying. You know, a lot of people say, well, I don't really believe in the hereafter. I don't believe in God. And I said, so you believe that we're just going to be, you know, basically, you know, worm food. That's it. That's it. Nothing else after that. I said, there has to be more. We've seen miracle after. I just posted this on Facebook the other day that I saw. Uh, what was it? Uh, we are on a world spinning at, what, 26,000 miles an hour. There's a moon uh, rotating at a certain speed around us, and we, our, our planet actually rotates around a fireball. And, and people say they don't believe in miracles. How can that happen? It's a miracle. God put everything into line. You know, so God also put into us the desire to reproduce. And in Genesis 1.28, it says, and everybody thinks this is just in the physical sense, Genesis 1.28, and he amplified, it says, And God blessed them, granting them certain authority. And he said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth, and subjugate it, putting it under your power. See, it said, Be fruitful, and multiply. So just for the fun of it, I thought, because I always tell people, you know, when you're a Christian, you know, it says that God is spirit, worship him in spirit and truth. When you're a Christian, you, you know, you the spirit of God lives in you. And so you should be, um, producing fruit, godly fruit. So what is that godly fruit, you ask? I'm glad you asked. Galatians 5, to 23. Many of you have heard this. Actually, I don't have the passion tonight on that, but I have the Amplified. It says, um, but the fruit of the Spirit, the result of His presence within us, is love, unselfish concern for others, unselfish concern for others, joy, inner peace, Patience and not the ability to wait, but how we act while waiting. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Yes, this is the type of fruit that should be multiplying in our lives and in the people we talk to, the people we minister to, the people we teach. It's funny, as I'm, I'm reading those fruits of the Spirit, it does. I don't know about you, every time I read or I hear the fruit of the Spirit, I think of, well, I'm doing okay right there, Lord, but nah, not so good in this area, and so on. Uh, today, um, we live like, oh, 20, 25 minutes south of the New York border in PA. And um, I had to do our, our two-week shopping thing up in New York. We're closer in New York than we are in Pennsylvania to stores. And so, I, I mean, I was there by 8.30, and I didn't get home till 1.00. And I, if you know me, I go into a store, I have a mission. But the Lord keeps telling me, you know, you're going to touch a lot of people. Not literally, but I mean figuratively. And you need to set the example for me. So in my shopping experience, I really felt the Lord just using me and being, being delightful and joyful and everything. Up until Walmart. Man, there's just some, that, that place needs to, have to be anointed with oil. I'm just telling you all the time because there's some really wonderful people there. I mean, they were very helpful. All the workers were helpful. They were all pleasant. They were all nice. I was standing in a line and we all are supposed to be six feet apart, you know, and everybody's doing it. Everybody's being good except the guy behind me. And so I'm all day up until Walmart. I am walking in the fruits of the spirit. Oh boy. Jesus is, you know, just using Rob, okay? And all of a sudden, the guy behind me, he gets about a foot and a half, two feet away from me. And then he starts tapping his feet because this, unfortunately, there's a long line and, 
the person going as fast as they can, but we all have to be separated. And oh, he, he just, oh, uh, the old man and me wanted to just sit, turn around and just give him all that in a bag of chips, you know? But I didn't. You would have been proud of me. I just totally ignored. Um, I but it was hard. I did. I went all day saying, Lord, thank you, thank you. And then I kept hearing the Lord say, Rob, just relax. No big deal. So I stayed away. I did, excuse me. I didn't even say nothing to the guy. I just, okay. <laughs> but when I got up to the cash register, I made sure to compliment the cashier because she was trying her, her hardest. She wasn't messing around. She was slow and steady. And she wasn't just slow, but she was steady. And that gets the job done just as fast as somebody who keeps making mistakes and have to fix things. So she was great. So anyway, that's what, so I'm talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Um, God wants us to be fruitful and multiply. Me, being fruitful for the kingdom of God is what I'm trying to say. So he built that into us. And last week I told you, I read Matthew uh, 28, 19 to 20. In the new NIV it says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Remember that? And, you know, it's saying make disciples. Well, how do you do that? You teach them. You, you show them. You show them your passion. Um, first thing he did is he taught them. He began to teach them right away. Each individual disciple of Christ realized back when um, that it was his responsibility, at least I, I believe they did, that it was their responsibility to begin to teach others what was taught to them by Jesus. And that one day that pupil would become the next teacher. And, you know, that that's something that, and, and people say, don't call yourself a teacher necessarily, but you might be a mentor. You might be just somebody who shares. You know, I remember many, many years ago, a wonderful couple, an older, um, what would you call them, uh, retired couple, uh, came to work at the other ministry that we were at. It was a children's home, very large, had a lot of things to do. And the man that was um, the, the husband, he was a great welder, a great mechanic, very creative. And the wife, she was wonderful at working in the kitchen, being a dorm mom, a little bit of everything. So they were just a great asset to our ministry. And I remember, and I mean, I still see it today. There's a Pastor Tim's son. Every day when he'd get out of school, he would throw his books inside the house and run out to the shop where this old gentleman was. And this gentleman taught him how to weld, taught him how to work on things. And it just, he reproduced himself in Pastor Tim's son. And it, I mean, the gentleman's still alive. He's in his 90s, I believe. Wonder, in fact, he still supports our ministry. A wonderful man. And he reproduced himself in Pastor Tim's son. And and if we ever have a mechanical problem or question, we can just call on Pastor Tim's son, and normally he can fix it, and he normally can fix it very quickly. And it's just it's cool because you see that kind of reproducing. It's in the kingdom realm, but it's also in the physical realm. So are you doing that kind of thing? You know, uh, I remember uh, in First Corinthians three, Paul the apostle, as he's writing to the Corinthians, he calls the uh, fellow Christians, a new, he calls the Christians he's been talking to, writing to and teaching, he, he challenges them a little bit. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 1, this is in the Passion Bible, it says, Brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I found it impossible to speak to you as those who are spiritually mature people. For you are still dominated by the mindset of the flesh, and because you are immature infants in Christ... Verse 2, I had to nurse you and feed you with milk, not with solid food or, or more advanced teachings, because you weren't ready for it. In fact, you are still not ready to be fed solid food. For you are living your lives dominated by the mindset of the flesh. Ask yourselves, is there jealousy among you? Do you compare yourselves with others? Now this, this is the Passion Bible. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 3, but it, it reads the same way in the Amplified and so on. But this is more... In, um, in the world, or in the today's language, we'll put it that way. Now get this, for you're living your lives dominated by the mindset of the flesh. That's because they're still on the milk. Milk of the word, uh, the simple stuff. Ask yourself, is there jealousy among you? Do you compare yourselves with others? Do you quarrel little like children and end up taking sides? 
If so, this proves that you are living your life centered on yourselves, dominated by the mindset of the flesh, behaving like unbelievers. Verse 4. For when you divide yourselves up in groups, a, a Paul group or Apollos group, you're acting like people without a spirit, or and that's capital S, a spirit of influence. In verse 5, he goes on, Who is Apollo, really? Or who is Paul? Aren't we both just servants through whom you believed our message? See, people shouldn't say, Oh, I want to be like Pastor Rob. I want to be like Pastor Tim. I want to be like so-and-so. No, I want to be the Christ I see in them. So aren't you... Aren't... <laughs> And aren't each of us doing the ministry the Lord has assigned to us? Are we? I hope. And you say, but I'm not, I'm not doing a ministry. But are you at work? Are you doing your job? But are you bearing forth the fruit of the Spirit? Verse 7. Now, let me go back to verse 6. I was with the one who planted the church, and Apollos came and cared for it. But it was God who caused it to grow. That's what I'm trying to say. Paul kept saying, don't don't point yourself, well, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Paul. No, I'm of Christ, I am of the Father. This means the one who plants is not anybody special. See, just because I'm a pastor, I'm, no, I'm not any more special than, than an evangelist or a, a hairdresser or somebody that would lead somebody to the Lord. I'm, no, I'm not any different. I just have a different gift and calling. So he goes on to say, this means one who, who plants is not anybody special nor the one who waters for God is the one who brings the supernatural growth now the one who plants and the one who waters are equally important and on the same team get it but each will be rewarded for his own work see God will reward us according to our heart we are co-workers with God and you are God's cultivated garden the house he is building God has given me unique gifts this is Paul speaking as a skilled master builder who lays a good foundation, a good foundation of God's word. Afterward, another craftsman comes and builds on that. So the builders beware. Let every builder do his work carefully according to God's standards. So it needs to be according to God's standards, not our standards or the world's standards. You know, I, I heard somebody on the radio say today, there's a lot of compromise in the church. And at first I thought, oh, people are... No, it's, and he wasn't being positive. He was saying a lot of people are falling into the ways of the world. A lot of the churches are falling into the ways of the world. Verse 11, For no one is empowered to lay an alternative foundation other than the good foundation that exists, which is Christ Jesus. Paul wrote to Timothy. I mentioned this last week, but this is in the Passion. It said, My dear son uh, Timothy, live your life empowered by God's free-flowing grace, which is your, your true strength found in the anointing of Jesus and your union with him. And that all you've learned from me, now get this, Paul saying all that you learned from me, confirmed by the integrity of my life, pass on to the faithful leaders, future leaders, who are competent to teach the congregations the same revelation. So pass it on to believers who are competent. See, a lot of, there's a lot of believers out there that they've been, Christ, they've been in Christian church for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And as you talk to them, you'll find that they, they just have a surface belief. And anything that seems deep, they're just repeating something that I said or another pastor said. It hasn't become revelation knowledge, and it must become revelation knowledge in your life. Paul was telling Timothy, up to two generations, of, be prepared. Two more generations. Remember this. It says, Confirmed by the integrity of my life, pass it on to faithful leaders who are competent to teach the congregation to the same revelation. And the one, the one actual translation, I think the Amplified, it actually talks about generation to a generation. You know, are you pouring in to the next generation? How, you know, how about you and I? What are we imparting to people around us? And people say, well, I'm not imparting anything. Oh, yes, you are. One way or another, you are imparting something. Jesus, he returned to his hometown, remember in Mark chapter 6, to minister to him. The people, however, did not respond well to his ministry or his message. In fact, they took offense at him to the point that the Bible says he could not do miracles there except that he had laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. That's Mark 6, 5. 
Their response caused Jesus to wonder over their unbelief, but his also initiated an activity in Jesus that must be replicated in our lives. And what is that activity? The Bible says he was going around the village teaching, Mark 6, 6. So, hey, you know, they wouldn't, uh, they didn't have the faith for the healing. Uh, so he began teaching. And that's something I really want uh, to talk more about tonight. Jesus confronted their faithfulness, faithlessness, I'm sorry, in his hometown with the impartation of the truth. So he confronted, they said, well, we don't believe, you know, who is this guy to heal? So he began to explain and teach the truth. That's what the ministry of teaching does. It, it, impart, it imparts the truth into people's lives. Jesus basically gave his disciples an assignment to replicate, get this, to replicate uh, what he instruct, instructed them to do. Seriously. He, he really meant that in a sincere ma um, manner. He, he said to them, Go and you'll do even greater things than me. And and it was all through the district through the Holy Spirit's move, of course, later. But in John fourteen twelve, let me let me show you. Because Jesus said, Go and you'll do even greater things. Um John fourteen twelve. Very truly I tell you, this is the NIV, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Now let me read the passion, then I'll explain that a little more. And the Passion Bible says, I tell you this timeless truth. The person who follows me in faith, believing in me, will do the same mighty miracles that I do, even greater miracles than these, because I go to be with the Father. So, uh, the important thing is, now think about this, when the Holy Spirit, and he's, you know, when God was going to send the Holy Spirit, the important part of that was that that Holy Spirit would be indwelling in every believer being indwelt in every believer and people sticking to sound doctrine teaching about teaching and healing and so on and about kingdom principles then that would be multiplied hundreds of thousands of times instead of just one jesus going around evangelizing teaching preaching and so on pretty soon you have a hundred a thousand 10,000, 100,000, a million people, if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, teaching kingdom principles, teaching what the Word says. I'm not sure if we truly realize the power and the potential that teaching has in ministry. And and you, I keep saying ministry, but remember, ministry means, if I minister, that means I serve. Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, leaven, I'm sorry, leaven, which has the capacity to affect everything it is part of. That's in Matthew 13, 33. Leaven has the capacity to affect everything it is part of. A little leaven of yeast affects everything, right? Leaven is an influencing or fermenting agent. It originates from a word that means to boil within. In the natural, leaven causes dough to rise, but in the spiritual realm, leaven causes the mind and the heart to be provoked in, the good, in a good sense. Now, I, I have never heard it put that way. That is so well. I don't know who said that, but I found that recently that it, a little bit of spiritual leaven in you should provoke your mind and your heart to do something. When the kingdom leaven is dispatched into minds and hearts of people through ministry of teaching, it boils in their spirit until the truth permeates every aspect of their life. The teaching of God's word, or leaven, is so profound and influential that God declared in Isaiah 55, 11, it will not return to me empty. He said, God's word will go, and it will accomplish what it needs to accomplish. And, you know, I thought about that, and, you know, when it talked about hearing the kingdom principles, walking in that, and, and just really having a passion about that. Uh, a very close friend and mentor that I had many years ago, I mean many years ago, about 35 years ago, he has such a passion for Christ. I don't, I don't know if I'd ever met anybody that had such a passion. And yes, he had his quirks. He wasn't perfect. None of us are. But I saw the passion of Christ in him and 
I mean, I know the Holy Spirit was moving in within him because he was he he told me his wife told me these stories also. He'd be splitting wood, you know, to to make extra money, and all of a sudden the the Holy Spirit would download something into him. He'd run in the house. He'd tell his wife, "Hey, write this down and tell me if it's in the Bible," because he didn't read at that time. He hadn't read a lot of the Bible, and his wife had, and so she'd say, "Oh yeah, that's in Isaiah fifty-five, and that's in this and that." And so he, he actually began to read and study the Bible even more. And so he had that, that, that teaching, you know, he listened to good teachers, quality, you know, good preachers and teachers. And, and the Holy Spirit began to teach him. And the, you could see it. It was permeating out of every part of his body. And I was blessed to, um, to hang out with him for a while, for about two years, I guess, maybe a year. And, I mean, during free time, if you have such a thing, I was teaching in a Christian school at the time and also a head usher and some other things. So I was, I was busy, but in my free time when I wasn't with Peg and Josh, we would go into the streets of York and we would minister to the drug addicts and the alcoholics. And the, the passion that people saw in him for Christ because they knew him when he used to do drugs. So we could go to places nobody else could go safely. And ironically, it wasn't the, and I don't mean to call it, people would call it the low life. They didn't bother us. We had no, nobody ever tried to steal from us, hurt us, do anything. But the, you know, who, unfortunately, who bothered us the most is people that were so-called Christians or good people complained and the policemen had to come up to us and tell us we couldn't talk to people about Jesus on the streets. Well, you can't do that. No, you, they said you can't have people gather around. So we'd have to walk down the street and talk to people, you know, and, and buy people coffee and that kind of thing. And we had a great time. So we were able to minister to people, and they could see Christ boiling up within us. And I, I saw miracle signs and wonders happen I had never seen before. I mean, it, it was a cool crazy. Uh, we see in the scriptures where Paul entered the city of Ephesus, and for over two years... He taught the truth. It took him two years in the one city. One scholar noted that Paul taught the word over 3,000 hours in those two years. Not only did the word spread throughout Asia, but the Bible indicates that the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. That's in Acts 19.20. Teaching is a prevailing ministry because it's the distribution of kingdom, and I love this, of kingdom, uh, laven, that deeply affects people with eternal realities. Remember, Levin can influence and provoke your mind and your heart. So one person wrote it this way. This was this was really, really good. He wrote, I realize that people must respond obediently to the truth that's been given, but I believe that if we faithfully teach God's word, it will germinate them it, it will germinate them with kingdom princip possibilities. So if we give them the word, kingdom possibilities will begin to, to grow in within them. That's why we've all been commissioned to teach nations everything that Jesus commanded, Matthew 28, 20. Teaching is more than merely dispensing instruction to others. The word teaching in the Bible refers to the impartation of the truth. That's a challenge, isn't it? Rob McCorkle, in his article, Replicating Jesus, said the following teaching actually is a transfer of the installation into another person the truth that has shaped our lives get that the installation into another person the truth that has shaped our lives so you don't want, you know tell people how god and his word changed you most anyone can explain a lesson but biblical teaching is imparting into a person's life now you know i I don't purposely go around preaching and teaching to people other than, you know, in church. But I, when God opens up an, an opportunity, hey, I'll share with people. I mean, I was at, um, I guess it was Rite Aid. Well, we see, we see a lot of things happen at Rite Aid. Is it Rite Aid? I guess it is. And I met up with an old guy that, um, he was 10 years older than me, almost exactly. He'd been in Vietnam. Uh, he'd been on a on a ship in Vietnam. And we talked probably for about 30 minutes and just how God, how things had changed in our lives. 
and only the last couple of minutes did I share with him that I was a pastor. He knew exactly where our ministry was. He'd heard about us. But I, I didn't preach to him that whole 30 minutes. I just listened to him. I listened to his heart. He listened to my heart. And when we left there, it was like old friends. And you know, sometimes we just need to listen. We need to minister. And then we need to pour into and part into people's lives. See, in other words, we don't merely give a message to someone. Rather, we become that message. Does that make sense? Our lives are to be personified. I love this. Our lives are to personify the kingdom realities that we talk about. You know, you might talk about it, but do you really, do they really see that in your life? Does it really make a difference? We're not to teach theories and ideas, but we're to impart realities that have become part of who we are. Truth has to become visible. People have to see, they have to see the truth in us. It has taken, I love this, it has to take on flesh and blood. The truth has to take on flesh and blood so that we're able to give away what we actually possess. Our life, I mean, we could sit there and repeat and repeat, but unless it's real, people don't believe it. Our lives are to become the illustration upon which we show and tell who we really are. I don't know who said that, but that's good. Our lives are to become the illustration upon which we show and tell. Hmm. And in some cases, we may never open our mouths to teach some of our greatest truths. You see that? It might you might not have to say a word, but people are watching you, aren't they? Romans one eleven through twelve, and that's in the, in the Amplified. It says, "For I long to see you, that I may share with you some spiritual gift to strengthen and to establish you." That in you know this is Paul speaking to the Roman uh, Roman people in Rome, I should say. That is that we may be mutually encouraged. So he said, "I want to give you something spiritually to uh, gift to strengthen you." And to, and to establish you, and to encourage you, and to comfort you by, and it says, that is, that we may be mutually encouraged and comforted by each other's faith, both yours and mine. So Paul even said, you know, that we would be mutually. And you know, when you come up to a believer, a new, you know, a believer that you don't even know is a believer right away, but you sense in your heart, you really begin to feel that the connection, the spiritual connection, Paul went to impart supernatural but Paul went to impart supernaturally supernatural abilities into all of his followers. This meant that Paul was going to teach believers in Rome how to remain steadfast, fully devoted to God, and to be supernaturally empowered by the Holy Ghost. Yet teaching for Paul was more than expressing spiritual stuff. And and see he had that ability because, you know, he was a Pharisee. I mean, he was a, a very learned and under, understood person. I mean, he, but when he became a Christian, it's almost like he threw all that out. And he said, God used me. And then God used him with his great words that he had, but he, he imparted into other people's lives by the demonstration in his life. Remember when he was at the island of Patmos and he grabbed a piece of wood and a snake bit him and he just went over to the fire and shook the snake off and... They all thought, well, he's going to be dead. And, and then when he didn't die, they tried to worship him. And he said, don't worship me. No, he just demonstrated the power of God in his life. I remember, oh, Ken Gobb. He's a great evangelist. He has, he has a, you, have, you want to read a great book during this time. It's called God's Got Your Number. I, I think I have bought probably 50 or 60 of them. And you, you can't, I don't think you can find them new. Maybe they have them new on Amazon. But I guarantee you can find them new somewhere. But most of the times, I just buy used ones. And what I'll do is I'll buy them, and then I'll give them away. It's called God's Got Your Number by Ken Gobb, G-A-U-B. He has story after story of how God moved in his life. And miracle after miracle, and how... And you might not believe it, but I do. I believe what happened in that man's life. And what... And I guess the... The icing on the cake, when I was reading that book, he told a story, because he was from 80 miles away from my hometown, which I didn't know anything about that until 25 years later. I had to move from the West Coast to the East Coast to read a guy's book from the West Coast. I know that sounds crazy. But as I read this book, I'm going, yeah, this is interesting, this is interesting. And then all of a sudden, 
he wrote in his book how he had gone to Washington State Penitentiary. And uh, my dad was a guard there. Actually, at the time, I think he was a captain. But he was a guard at that state penitentiary. And it was one of the roughest ones in Washington at that time. Now, I don't know anything about it now. But it was one of the roughest ones. And my dad was actually part of the riot squad. So if they were trying to take over the prison, the guards had to go in and take back the prison. And so there was a lot of, a lot of bad stuff going on. And I remember this Ken Gobb telling the story of how God told him to go in there right after. It was right after they'd just come off of, of lockdown. Lockdown is when everything is locked up. They can't, they can't go out of their cells except for maybe to eat, if even that. And I mean, there was just, there had been, they destroyed a couple of the wings and stuff. And, and so, um, he said, I went in there and he goes, and he said, I'm, and everybody, you could tell, you could feel the tension and he ministered to the people there and he led a lot of men to the Lord. But he, but what, this was the thing that was the icing on the cake. I knew he was for real because he told the story that my dad told me when it happened. It was in the, I want to say mid seventies that there was a guard that was um, a couple of guards actually that had taken a guy from the prison to the courthouse or to to be um, prosecuted for something that happened in the prison. And one of the guards picked up uh, a Bic lighter and flicked it. And when he did, it blew up. It was a bomb. Somebody had planted a bomb in a Bic lighter and he flicked it and it blew his fingers off and put his eye out. And this here's this preacher, tell, I, and I knew this happened for real because my dad, my dad came home and he was all worried that, hey, you know these convicts are going crazy. They're going to do this. They're going to do. I mean, dad, my dad was really worried, and so here this preacher was telling me all about something I knew was a fact, and my dad had even said, oh, now there's some preacher there trying to do. And I wasn't a Christian then. I was I wasn't a Christian. I really didn't care about Christian. I didn't care about anything. I just cared about myself. But I remember. To this day, I remember my dad coming home and saying, hey, there was a bomb that went off, and now they have a preacher coming in. You believe that? Lo and behold, I got to actually talk to that preacher years later because he called me on my birthday. Somebody called him and said, call Pastor Rob on his birthday, and it'll be a surprise. And he called, and I wasn't home. He left a message, and I thought, oh, this is, this is bogus. So I called the phone number right back, and I got the guy's secretary. And I said, is this Ken God Ministries? And he goes, the lady goes, yes, it is. Who are you trying to get a hold of? I said, well, I just got a phone call from Ken God wishing me happy birthday. Is this for real? He goes, yeah, hold on a minute. So he put Ken God on the phone, and we sit there, and we talk probably about 10 or 15 minutes. And I explained to him that when I was a heathen and non-Christian, I used to drive through the town that he had in, has had his ministry, I would see his buses and I would laugh thinking, oh, those Christians, they're a bunch of fakes. Lo and behold, I moved to the East Coast, read his book after I knew the Lord, and God changed my life. And here I am talking to a man that through his book imparted God's reality into my life. I know that sounds kind of crazy, but you know, often we, we forget about those men and women who have imparted things into our lives. I am... Um, I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, should I end this now? Yeah, I need I need to close here in a minute. Your life, how can I say this? The fact is you're always imparting something into people's lives. Your life always gives something away. You, you could be imparting something negative or something positive into someone's life. Uh, there was a lady today that I could tell she was just exhausted. She'd been working hard. She helped me find something right away, and I I just complimented her, and you could you could just see her countenance change, and you know when you compliment somebody, and I don't mean fake ones, I mean be honest, God will give you the right thing to say, and this happened over me oh five or ten times today it it happened, I could see people's countenance begin to change when I spoke positive things into them, knowing that the next person behind me might just be a jerk and treat them like trash. I hope that they go home thinking somebody really cares that, that I exist. So anyway, let me go on. You teach others the realities that you've allowed to shape your life by who you are and what you say and what you share. The question is, what are the life lessons that you are distributing? Good ones or bad ones? Something to think about. 
When Jesus traveled about the cities and villages, he taught people about the kingdom of God because it was within him and part of him. Can you share Christ that is in you and part of you in your way so people will see that God is real? He imparted a lifestyle that was fashioned after intimacy with the Father, and he commissioned us to fulfill the same assignment. So let's allow ourselves to be molded by the leaven of the kingdom so that we can teach other families, churches, cities, and nations realities of heaven. Become the message that you impart to others and watch the word of the Lord prevail wherever you walk. So it all starts right here. It starts right now in your heart and in mine. So I want to challenge you. It starts here. God really wants you to impart into other people's lives because whether you know it or not, you are imparting positive and negative things. I just want to bless you, be blessed, and I will see you Sunday morning at 1045. God bless.